I'd like to call the House Health Committee to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Representatives Alexander, Boyd, Bird, Clements, Here. Freeman, Gant, Here. Hakeem, Here. Hall, Here. Helton, Here. Hicks, Here. Jernigan, Kumar, Here. Marsh, Here. Mitchell, Here. Ramsey, Here. Cheryl, Here. Smith, Vaughn, Whitson, Here. Williams, Vice Chairman Leatherwood, Here. Chairman Terry. Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. All right, thank you. Before we get started here, do any of the members have any personal orders? Okay, seeing none, uh, we do have uh, some items on our agenda that we will get to shortly, some uh, resolutions, some bills, but on short notice, because we only had four items, uh, it seemed like a ideal opportunity to get uh, TenCare and the Department of Health to come provide us with their budget overview, and so I appreciate them coming. Uh, so without objection, uh, we will go out of session and hear from TenCare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. It's good to be with you, good to be with you, uh, you all again this afternoon. My name is Stephen Smith. I serve as the director of Ten Care, and we have other members of our leadership team that are up here with me today, and they they will introduce themselves as um, as we get into questions and and they respond. I do have just a few slides to go through, Mr. Chairman. At your at your request, we're going to go through these pretty quickly and and leave plenty of time for uh, questions and comments. And I will add that in the slide deck, we did have an appendix, and there are uh, there's a lot of more information in that appendix that relates relates to this budget uh, discussion. Our mission at Ten Care remains consistent, and that is to improve lives through high quality, cost effective care. And I hope that that mission is evident as we go throughout our presentation today. We've already spent some time this session talking about this theme of the past, present, and future of TenCare. And we're excited. We're, we're optimistic about uh, the, the present stage of where we are with, with TenCare and about that future. But we also know that we have challenges in front of us. And uh, we're, we're spending a lot of time trying to learn from our past so that we don't make some of the same mistakes that we've made and that we can learn from the successes that we've had over the past couple of decades. Speaking of that past, TenCare has a, a long but certainly an imperfect history. Uh, it really wasn't that long ago when double-digit growth trends and a very unstable uh, market in terms of our health plans. And uh, we also struggled with... Um, managing our utilization. Those things altogether threatened the very existence of TenCare. And so uh, back in 2004, the executive branch and the legislative branch uh, at the time worked together to make some major reforms uh, to the program. And oftentimes uh, the, the reduction in the numbers of members served gets the most attention when we talk about those reforms. Uh, but really, it, it was there were other things uh, that were put in place at that time, and you can see some of those on the screen. Um, if we look back at the decade prior to 2004, what we see is that 10-care enrollment grew by about 22%. But over that same time period, the 10-care budget grew by 224%. So that really confirms this idea that it, it's not just the numbers of members that we served, that led to those increased costs. It was also these other things that, that we were talking about, the, um, the inability to effectively manage utilization and the other things that you see on the screen here. There's often this idea that controlling the rising cost of healthcare by necessity means that you are decreasing access and you're decreasing quality. And actually we would contend that the opposite is true. Those things actually go hand in hand. And by controlling the rising costs of healthcare and getting a handle on these things, you can actually enhance services, enhance benefits, and serve more people. And we've proven that uh, as a 10 care program over the last two decades. So controlling cost growth, coordinating care, and properly managing utilization means that you can do more and, and it's not about doing less. 
And that's evidenced by some of the quality metrics and performance measures that we've seen uh, in TenCare uh, over the last several years. You can see some of these highlighted on the screen. Childhood immunizations are up, screenings are up, our neonatal abstinence syndrome births are down significantly. In fact, Tennessee is the only state in the country that is continuing to report a decline in NAS births, and that's something that we're really proud of. Uh, and that, of course, is due to the collective work, uh, the executive branch and the legislative branch working together on the opioid epidemic. And we've seen a sharp decline in the number of pills dispensed to our 10 care members. And we've also seen a sharp increase in the number of 10 care members that are receiving medication assisted treatment for opioid addiction. And then, as you can see, our customer satisfaction remains really high at 94 percent. And certainly one of our best measures when we look at quality and access, uh, one of our best measures is the grade that our own members give us. With that, we'll move into our cost increases for FY22, our, re our requested cost increases. And I'm not going to go through all these individually, uh, but I'll just highlight uh, just a couple. So first, uh, I'll call your attention to the medical inflation and utilization uh, number. And you all are accustomed to seeing this every year. This is our medical inflation and utilization increase. This is our anticipated trend or our growth. And I'll note that this represents a 1.42% growth trend, which is the lowest uh, in recent memories, the lowest that we, can, that we can remember and that we can find on record. We talk a lot at TenCare about our success in managing our trend and our cost growth. And we talk, uh, we talk about why that's so important to the state budget as a whole. This is where that shows up. It shows up in this trend number. To put that in better perspective, if TenCare had performed at the state Medicaid average in terms of our cost growth over the past decade, we would have spent an additional $2 billion. Uh, so that's, B, uh, that's billion. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence uh, to note that over that same time frame, that's about equal to the same record investment that the state has made in K through 12 public education. So the point of all that is to note that the, the cost of 10 care being average, uh, it, it, there are real costs there. Uh, they are substantial. We don't want to be average at 10 care. And uh, frankly, we don't have the luxury of being average. And, and when the state, uh, if we are average, you can see that we'll, we'll have these really large uh, cost impacts, and that impacts the state as a whole. But because TenCare makes up such a large portion of the state budget, it's inevitable that if we are unable to control those rising costs, then that will lead to reductions in the TenCare budget and cuts to our program. And that's something that we want to avoid. I do want to call out two really important uh, maternal health initiatives that you'll see here on the screen. And you all may recall these from last year because they were they were funded in the FY21 budget. And then, of course, when the pandemic hit, we unfortunately, they had to be removed from the budget. The first is a dental pregnancy program, uh, which will extend dental coverage to pregnant women 21 and over. So we know from research that oral health in children and specifically early childhood cavities are directly related to the bacteria that is transmitted from the mother to the child. And treating these conditions today often results in very high cost settings like the emergency room. And oftentimes there's anesthesia that's associated with that. And both of those things carry increased clinical risk. So we believe that this coverage initiative will uh, make a big difference. Uh, we actually think it will save dollars in the long term while also improving the quality of care. The second item would extend postpartum coverage for 10 care members from 60 days to 12 months. We know that maternal mortality remains an issue that uh, it's nationwide and certainly Tennessee is no exception. The, po the late postpartum period is critically important. It remains a vulnerable time in the health of the mother and, and also the child. So this initiative is, is really about, it's as much about the child as it is the mother. We want to set that child up for success from birth, and we think that this initiative will play a large uh, part in that. You heard the governor at his State of the State address talk about the uh, adoption initiative. And this would provide 10-care coverage, <clears throat> excuse me, for adopted youth. 
which we believe will be an important tool in facilitating more adoptions. Presently, we have a number of DCS uh, children who do not qualify for any public adoption assistance, and this can create a barrier uh, to those adoptions where the children have to rely on the insurance coverage that the adopting parents have. So we want to eliminate any burdens that we can here, and we think this is a, a tool, one of the tools that can eliminate those burdens. On the reduction side, I'll highlight a couple of points. Uh, first, we are proud to once again play a large role in the overall necessary reductions at the state level. So this year for FY22, the reductions in 10 care represent 57% of the total reductions that are contained in the state budget. Second, we've been able to propose those reductions with minimal impact on our 10 care members. So for example, you'll see the large reduction in the pharmacy trend. That is actually a reflection of our, of our actual expenditures over the last couple of years. Trends have moderated substantially in, in pharmacy. We're doing a better job of our rebate collections. We're doing a better job just in our overall management of our program. And um, this will have no impact on our members or our providers. You also will see at the bottom the FMAP rate change. This is our federal matching percentage. This year that works to our advantage. This is uh, strictly a federal calculation and it looks at Tennessee relative to the rest of the country. And then every year uh, we get a, a, a matching rate from the federal government. And for the second year in a row, this works to our advantage. The 90 day refill item, this makes permanent a policy that was put in place when the pandemic started. Uh, it's one that allows our providers to write scripts for maintenance medications for 90 days. So this of course benefits our members because it's a convenience uh, item for them that they can make less trips to the pharmacy. Um, and also it, in, it improves drug adherence, which is, which is really important. This provision applies to our, our low cost generic medications, our maintenance medications. It represents about 10% of the medications that are part of our formulary at TenCare. And then the last item I'll point to is the 340B item. And the 340B program is a, it, it's a complex program. It's a federal program. It, it's recently received quite a bit of attention at the federal level. We know from our uh, OIG auditors that this is something that HHS at the federal level is taking a really close look at. But at its core, this item is about making sure that TenCare as a taxpayer funded insurance provider is paying no more for these 340B drugs than we should be. And the way that we do that is we ensure that we are collecting all of the rebates that we are eligible to receive under the Medicaid rebate program, which is a requirement of, of federal law and also ensuring that we are paying no higher than the ceiling price for these 340B drugs. And that ceiling price has been negotiated at the federal level by the federal government with the pharmaceutical companies. And so we believe it's important for us as a taxpayer funded Medicaid entity uh, to pay no higher than that negotiated price that's been negotiated by another government entity. And the 340B program was actually born out of the Medicaid rebate program. So we need to be sure that we are administering this in a way that ensures that we are getting the very benefit that the federal government intended for Medicaid programs to receive. And I know that's a, that's a quick overview of 340B. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, as we get into, into, that, um, into that portion of, the, of this presentation. And then lastly, Mr. Chairman, I'll just... Um, uh, revisit FY21. As, as you all know, in the FY21 budget, uh, you directed uh, departments and state government to uh, reduce vacant positions, and 10Care played a large role in that, and we eliminated 34 positions, and so I just wanted to, to bring that to your attention. Uh, that completes my prepared remarks. Mr. Chairman, glad to, glad to answer any questions. Right, thank you. Uh, Leader Gant, you recognize. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a quick, I, I can look around uh, the, the representative in front of me here, so hopefully you can see me as I talk. Uh, the 340B program that you were talking about, does that take any specific dollars away from any local hospitals? So the, the overall item is, it's about a $49 million item in the budget, and that reflects uh, two buckets. Uh, one of those buckets is uh, will come from rebates that we collect through the Medicaid rebate program. 
And that portion of that 49 million will have no impact on any providers. The, the second bucket uh, relates to the ceiling price. And uh, to the extent that those providers are receiving a higher uh, price currently or, or a higher rate for those drugs than the ceiling price, then it will have an impact on those providers and it would, re it would result in a reduction in revenue that they are currently receiving. Our estimate is that it's about a 50-50 split. Again. Okay, has there, has there, I feel weird talking through the, there we go. Um, has there been any discussion with some of these hospitals that, you know, may see a hit from, from this to have some kind of compromise? We have had uh, we have had discussions. Um, I, I I don't want to speak for uh, any of those uh, entities, but I, I will say we've had some discussions. Um, you know, I think they would prefer that this item is w would not be in the budget. Um, I, I think for us, it, it's really a philosophical uh, decision to come forward with this because the three hundred and forty B program it's really a it's a really a distinct program and. Um, uh, and it was born out of the Medicaid rebate program, and and by law we are required to to get all those rebates. And and up to this point, we have not been able to do that because we just haven't had the information from the providers to know when they are providing a 340B drug to a Medicaid member. So now that now we have the information to collect, we have the ability to collect that information through some changes at the federal level. Uh, and now that we can collect that information. Uh, we we can clearly collect the rebates, but uh, from our perspective, if we're paying higher than the ceiling price on these drugs, then we're negating the very benefit of the rebate program because we the federal uh, law prohibits duplicate discounts. So um, if the 340B provider is buying those drugs at the discounted rate, then we cannot collect the rebate for that. Um, and what that does, in effect, is it means that we, uh, it's, it's negating the very benefit of the Medicaid rebate program that was designed so that government-funded Medicaid programs would not pay, pay higher prices for these drugs. Clear again. Okay, changing uh, topics. Uh, has there been any kind of new communication or discussion with, um, with the federal government about Medicaid expansion pertaining to Tennessee as of recent? We have not had any discussions. Uh, I do know as part of the uh, Recovery Act, there are some provisions in that, um, in that new law that uh, provide enhanced federal matching dollars for states that have not expanded, and, and those dollars tie to the existing population. Uh, but we have not had any, uh, any discussions with the federal government about that. Representative Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, uh, along those same lines, uh, your FMAP money. How much did you get last year in FMAP money? Well, I want to clarify, uh, Representative. So we get our traditional FMAP, and, but you may be talking about the enhanced federal matching we got when the pandemic hit. Uh, right. And, and so, yeah. Sure. I'm going gonna, gonna to defer to... Uh, William Aaron, who's our Chief Operating Officer. You're recognized. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is William Aaron. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Division of TenCare. Um, so for the enhanced FMAP, uh, of course, went into effect in March retroactive to January the 1st. Um, so for state fiscal year 2020, which of course ended June 30, we had six months worth of enhanced FMAP. Um, the amount that we received uh, that, you know, uh, that was uh, sort of against our base expenses was about $243 million. And Representative, I just put on the screen here, this may be helpful. This, this shows you wh what our projection is, and it really dates back to fiscal year 20, and it extends all the way into this first quarter of 21. So this is what we know uh, today. Um, now, it's very possible that, that enha those enhanced dollars are going to continue because, um, and, and in fact, um, the expectation is that that's going to continue to the end of the calendar year, but but this is what we know today, and the and the projected amount is six hundred and ninety four million. Okay, thank you. So we're we're near seven hundred million, and I think that's going to increase, you know, for this year, uh, if I'm 
I think, if I'm correct. So let's go along the lines of ex- expansion because I think the state of Wyoming expanded today, a nice liberal state, you know, uh, I think <laughs> very conservative. Uh, I think the state of Alabama is looking to expand. So it would increase those dollars probably, would you say, 6 to 10% more at least in federal dollars coming to the state of Tennessee if we expand it on top of the seven hundred million. Well, I want I want to uh, be clear. I want to separate the the dollars that we're looking at here because that's really tied to uh, our increased expenses due to COVID, and and those dollars that we received are really uh, provided to states to address those increased costs. And what you what you're looking at here on the slide is our projections for where our enrollment is going to be. And, and the point here is that uh, it may appear as though we have a, a lot of dollars sitting in our fund balance, and at some point we're going to get more dollars for the enhanced FMAP. But I, I want everyone to, to understand that um, once the pandemic ends, we will start we'll start that gradual decline of our membership. But that's going to be a that's that's going to be a probably a twelve month process. So it's not as though you snap your fingers and the costs go away. And so the the dollars that you see here. Uh, the main purpose of those uh, are to address the cost that you see here. Now, your other question about the additional um, FMAP or matching dollars that are part of this Recovery Act, um, it is accurate that those would bring additional dollars into the state if we if we chose to expand. And, and the dollars are, are certainly, um, they are significant. Um, but I, I want to I separate the two. And that's right, thank nice. you, and that's fine. But I mean, I'm just trying to, you know, right now, what are we at percentage? Right now, at what seventy? What's our F map percentage? Seventy two point five. Well, something? it's 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 roughly sixty five. But then we got a six six point two percent increase during the pandemic. So so um, it's at seventy two point five. So we're in the we're in the top ten in the nation. So that's at 72. So what would that percentage be, you know, separating the two? So we're at 72. If we expanded, would that percentage not go to 90? Well, if, so if we expand, then for the expansion population, we would get a 90% match. Um, under this provision that's in the Recovery Act for the existing population, we would get a, an additional 5% match. So it, it would be our traditional 65%, 65 plus 5, so about 70%. And, and that's limited to two years. That provision is, is, is limited to two years. So, so what you're saying is we're being able to afford the people who are on the program now at 72%, but any additional people, we would only have to pay 10%. Uh, under the Affordable Care Act, we we would pay ten. We would pay ten okay. percent of of the expansion population. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm going to try to keep us in um, on our time frame here. I see the Department of Health has come in. I'm going to take one more question. Uh, questioner, uh, Representative Smith, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director, and gra- congratulations on a good report. Uh, returning to what Leader Gant, uh, the questioning that he was looking at, uh, specifically at the rather large sum of money that appears to be in the reduced savings and the reductions, uh, looking at the federal pharmacy trend at minus uh, 48.5 million, the state at 24.6 million. Does that total of 73.2 million in reduced pharmacy reflect the savings over in the 340B? Or or, or are we talking about uh, a total of 112,000 plus dollars that are total uh, cuts in pharmacy? Right, so those are two separate categories. The pharmacy trend, it, it really is not, um, I would argue it's not a cut. It really is just reflective of our actual expenditures. So a couple of few years ago, the, the pharmacy growth was just skyrocketing um, and there, there were some runaway costs there and, and we've done a much better job and those trends have moderated over the years. And so we're, we're able to come forward with the pharmacy trend reduction because we're just we're just no longer spending those kinds of dollars. The 340B, um, 
I would look at that differently. So that that's that is different because the pharmacy trend that's having that's going to have no impact on any provider or any member. But the 340B, of course, would have an impact on those 340B providers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A follow up, and then back to the 340B program. Um, because I have, and my colleagues sitting right here beside me, we have three uh, hospitals in our county, and two of those hospitals get to select their service lines. They choose cardiology, they choose oncology, they choose orthopedist, and so they choose very profitable service lines. the The county hospital chooses to be a county hospital. And so they take the meth babies, they take the burn patients, they take the, you know, the, hey, hold my beer as I drive my ATV into the wall. They take the trauma. And, and, and these, this is also the hospital that has a very heavy and active 340B program. And so what I'm hearing is at the state level, we're seeing about $55 million in cuts to hospitals through the, th the 340B program. Is that an accurate statement? That that would be higher than than our estimate. So our, our estimate, um, and you can see it here on the screen, is is about forty nine million. Um, now there is a portion, and maybe what you're referring to, there's a portion in the in the current hospital assessment that sort of buys back some of these dollars, and that's about six million. So that does equal about fifty five. So that may be that may be where uh, where you're coming up with that number. One, one follow-up, and I just want to ask that any information that you provide Leader Gant as a follow-up, um, provide for my colleague and I that have a very heavy uh, reliance on our county um, hospital, and just know that we're very interested in understanding. It's, it's great to see a, a balanced budget and those type things, but when you're creating a business model that's just not sustainable for public health, uh, we've got to figure out something, and I, I appreciate the fact that if we're making sure that the patient's getting their medication, but but if we're if, if we're really hurting those people that are choosing to take these patients, and they're the sickest ones, AIDS patients, uh, immunosuppressed patients, people that are turned away at more profitable hospitals with cancer, uh, we've got to make sure that we're not harming our safety net. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, appreciate you uh, coming in today. Uh, thank you guys for coming here. There are several other members that have questions. I would just ask that those members uh, submit you those questions. If you don't mind uh, copying uh, my office on those and I can get them to all the other members and uh, hopefully that we will have another opportunity because we've got a lot of discussion to have, but to, to have you back uh, in front of us to discuss uh, more of TenCare. But thank you for yeah. joining us today. Thank you. All right, while we are out of session, um, we have the, the uh, Department of Health. Like thank you for joining us today, and um, obviously, for the record, uh, state your name and all that good stuff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Lisa Piercy, Commissioner of Tennessee Department of Health. To my right is Dr. Morgan McDonald, our Deputy Commissioner of Population Health. And to my left is Valerie Oliver, Assistant Commissioner of Administrative Services. Thank you, and I'm uh, uh, happy to hear your, your budget. Thank you. I'm happy to present it. Uh, hello, committee members. Thank you for having us today. Um, so I, I first wanted to um, uh, start with the obvious, which is uh, what we've been working on for a year now um, at our COVID-19 response. Uh, it would take weeks, not one slide to cover all of it. But I will hit a few highlights for you. Uh, since we put these slides together, uh, this vaccine number is growing uh, much higher now. This says one and a half million. Uh, we are now at close to 2.3 million vaccines. We now have one and a half million Tennesseans vaccinated. Uh, something else that we're proud of is we're now uh, approaching the 7 million mark on testing. I know that a lot of focus right now is on vaccine, 
Um, but testing is still an important part. And it was something that was um, very, uh, a very strong focus early on and something that a lot of straight states struggled with. Um, but we have had a very robust and free and widely accessible testing program since the very beginning. A couple other programs that I'm particularly proud of. Uh, one is our hospital staffing assistance grants programs. That was administered by Dr. McDonald, who's joining me at the table today. This really helped provide a lot of financial support for hospitals that were faced with additional PPE cost, additional staffing cost, uh, as well as a concurrent loss of revenue due to uh, lower volumes from the non-COVID space. That was helpful, as was the development of COVID-specific nursing homes and COVID-specific nursing units in nursing homes. That program was also led by Dr. McDonald and her team. Um, and I think you'll remember, we've had a pretty strong focus on the senior population throughout this entire response. They are our most vulnerable. They are the ones who are more likely to be hospitalized and to, and to pass away from the virus. And so we have had uh, a staunch focus on them throughout. What we did in nursing homes was to create specific units where long-term care patients could go if they contracted COVID in the nursing home, they could go to one of those units. Or likewise, if a person needed to be discharged from a hospital, either to go back to a nursing home or a short stay, some people call that rehab, skilled nursing facility, they can go there uh, into a unit where they can be properly cared for. And not only does that help keep infections out of the nursing home at large, it helps hospitals with their throughput. You will remember back in November, December, January, when hospitals were really starting to get crunched for beds, having these units allowed hospitals to move their patients through faster, uh, which was a real win for all. The final thing that I'll mention, um, and when I, when I think back about uh, what, what will probably be um, one of our biggest legacies during this is how well we took care of the elderly in nursing homes. Did we do everything perfectly? No. But did our outcomes in Tennessee uh, exceed that of our peers? Absolutely. And that means that we have grandparents and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and parents who survived. And if they had been in another state, they may not have. Our death rate in nursing homes is 30% lower than in other states. And we have been very proud of that work uh, to protect our seniors who we value so much. Thank you. We, we like the older people. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're pretty special. Um, we also have continued other work during this. You know, we've obviously had a very um, uh, singular focus throughout this pandemic, but it doesn't mean that our other work has stopped. Um, we have continued our operations as best as we can. Some of it has had to be scaled back. Some of it has had to look a little bit differently, like a lot of different businesses. Uh, but we continue to have some public health wins outside of the COVID space. One of them was in our WIC program. So Women, Infants, and Children's, that's the supplemental food program for young, um, young mothers, new mothers, and, and young children. That did require some in-person visits before. We were able to convert that to a virtual platform and do that through telehealth, like many other medical providers have done, uh, and able to still continue those services and even grow the program. We've also been able to provide other services by telehealth, uh, which allowed for a large percentage of the population to still get their primary care uh, and still get their public health services despite the limitations of the pandemic. A couple of statistics, uh, and then I'll get to the budget. Over the last four years, we have had a 27% reduction in neonatal abstinence syndrome and a 26% reduction in sleep-related infant deaths. So these are two metrics that um, uh, were very high in Tennessee, uh, and we have not only been able to continue our um, uh, progression on that, but also sustain that throughout the pandemic. So to the budget, um, I want to uh, remind you that our funding at the Department of Health uh, is around $685 million a year, and it comes about a third, third, third state, federal, and other sources. The way that is broken down, uh, the two largest categories on the top right are local health services. That's what you typically think of when you think of health departments and the services delivered there. But on the top left is other health services, things that 
Maybe you're a little more familiar with them now, but uh, a year ago, you might not have known about our very large uh, laboratory services, public health laboratory services, as well as our emergency preparedness uh, and uh, communicable disease and our family health and wellness program. And then WIC, Licensure, and others are self-explanatory there. This is an important slide that I want to use to remind you that pandemic or not, we have been focused on our mission and our mission is to protect, promote, and improve the health and prosperity of those in Tennessee. That's very important when you have the link between economic stability and health, and that is not lost on us. And so I hope you have seen that come through in our work. The other thing that I hope you've seen come through, and I want you to keep in mind as we're looking at our budget priorities, are our two areas of focus, which are prevention and access. Prevention is your classic public health upstream work, um, and access is something that we have an important role in in Tennessee. It's somewhat unique, uh, whereas we provide a large uh, number of services for uninsured patients. So we serve as a safety net primary care. That's very unusual. In fact, I haven't found in over two years in this role, I haven't found any other state that's doing primary care, certainly not at scale like we are. So we'll talk more about that in just a minute. Uh, but even throughout the pandemic, uh, we have uh, strived to maintain these priorities. So for our uh, cost increases this year, we're proposing four key initiatives uh, that total just shy of four and a half million dollars. Uh, these do align with our strategic priorities and our mission. Uh, and I think you'll see that pretty clearly as we go through them individually. So as I just mentioned, uh, the first one is $2 million recurring to add to the safety net budget. Uh, we were grateful in the um, fiscal 21 year that the governor and General Assembly approved the largest addition to the history of the safety net program. Uh, and we are requesting an additional $2 million recur recurring to take the base funding from $19.9 million to $21.9 million. We're currently serving about a half million patient encounters per year. We do expect that to grow as a result of the pandemic with unemployment, with changes in benefits. People may still be employed, but their benefit structure may have changed. Uh, we do anticipate our need for safety net primary care to increase, um, and this would help serve that need. You can see in the bullet points there, this covers both primary care, specialty care, as well as dental services. The other uh, large item on our budget this year is a $2 million uh, recurring request for um, uh, tobacco-related funding. You've heard me say this statistic before, but it's pretty powerful when you're reminded of it. We all know that about 10 Tennesseans die a day for opioid-related illness, but about 30 Tennesseans die per day for tobacco-related illness. And so that's something that we tend to forget because tobacco use is very common and it's something that we're unfortunately used to. Tennessee ranks 43rd in the nation in smoking and we're one of only three states that don't have any recurring funding for tobacco prevention and cessation. Uh, so that is one of our requests this year. Uh, this is an example of um, some uh, teen generated and teen focused advertising. Uh, as you can see, it's focusing on electronic cigarettes or vaping, uh, which is overwhelmingly the most predominant uh, mechanism of tobacco use now amongst teenagers. The other two are smaller. One of them is uh, about $94,000 for a uh, retinal scanner system. So as I mentioned, we provide primary care to a large number of people across the state, and about 9,000 of our patients have diabetes. One of the tenets of screening for diabetes and making sure your diabetes is under control is retinal screening for diabetic retinopathy. That's just looking in the back of the eye to make sure that the eye is not being damaged by diabetes. Our current equipment is outdated. Uh, we're not able to serve our current patients. This is a pretty affordable system. This is for the entire state. These little handheld devices all across the state, uh, about 82,000 of this is non-recurring. It's a one-time expense. And then it's about 12,000 for recurring expense for the software and the uh, licensing. 
And then the final request uh, is $250,000 for an integrated data system. This is to expand our work in our opioid surveillance program. So, you know, that uh, our department is where all of the opioid-related and overdose-related data lives. Um, this program or this software will allow us to have more sophisticated data analysis as well as more integration uh, between data sources. This slide shows our fiscal 22 efficiency plan. Uh, we are proud to bring you uh, $8 million of efficiencies in both revenue offsets and operational efficiencies. This includes no personnel reduction and no reduction to frontline services. And finally, as a part of the fiscal 21 uh, appropriations bill, um, per your request, we have submitted a reduction of 100 vacant positions, uh, totaling uh, just shy of $6 million uh, and over 2.8 million of that returning to the state general fund. I appreciate your indulgence today and I'm happy to take any questions you have, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. Uh, on first on our list, uh, Representative Clements, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for being here today, Commissioner. Um, as you know, and based on reports, and I think you may have addressed some of this, it was the, the vaccination percentages and the willingness of people to take vaccinations. Fortunately, the governor and the administration spent a lot of money on television ads encouraging people to wear facial coverings. Are there any plans to encourage people to get vaccinated or to dispel the myths surrounding vaccination? Thank you for that question, sir. Um, that's certainly very important. And the short answer is yes, absolutely. Um, we actually have a strategy session tomorrow just about that very thing. And right now we're in the market, uh, market research phase of that entire advertising campaign. Some of the vaccine hesitancy we have encountered has been expected and anticipated. Um, we've been dealing with vaccine hesitancy in the department for years. It was well before COVID. Uh, and so we we sort of anticipated some of it. There has been, to be quite honest, some vaccine hesitancy that we did not anticipate. And we can't readily identify reasons for that. And so um, that's why the market research piece is really important in all 95 counties, particularly amongst rural conservatives and rural white men, why they are hesitant uh, and trying to drill down on that so we can address it properly. Uh, last I heard, that entire PSA campaign is scheduled to be released uh, end of April, 1st of May. Uh, and while that seems late now, I will remind you that our initial time frame was we didn't think we would get to all adults until late summer or early fall. So we're, we've just accelerated that time frame. President Clements? Yeah, well, thank you for that. That's good to hear. And I hope that, you know, we all lead by example. I expect the administration to do the same and, and get vaccinated and encourage others to do the same. So I appreciate that. Uh, my, uh, my last question, I'll keep this brief, is, um, what I didn't see in this uh, presentation and budget presentation is what is specifically being done by the department to prepare for the next pandemic. Because while we like to, you know, pat ourselves on the back for we may have done better than other states in one respect or another, the reality is people died. There are things that we could have done better. I think we all agree on that. So what is being done and what money is being allocated to prepare our state for the next pandemic? Because there will be another pandemic, I'm assuming. I'm, I think we can all agree on that. So what are we doing? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for that question. We have an entire division of emergency preparedness and pandemic preparedness is part of that. Um, part of why we had some early success is because they had done a lot of good preparations. But as you very aptly mentioned, we can always we always have room for improvement. We are being uh, faced with a CDC grant that's coming towards us um, that is very robust. And we are using it to upgrade our systems. We're using it to look at the positions that we have, that we need, um, where any gaps that we found. Was there equipment that we could have used more quickly? Were there systems that could have performed better? And those are the things that we'll be using that federal funding for. Uh, and I'm grateful to have it. Uh, it's just going to take some some effort to, to get through those line items. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just wondering, are you concerned about another, at least a mini surge over the next few weeks since, you know, we're in the top 10 now in infections from yesterday in the country 
and overall were the sixth most infectious state in the entire nation. So are, are you concerned that it's going to get bad again? Thank you for the question. I, I'm fairly certain it's going to get worse. What I don't know is how high the next surge will be. Uh, we are already starting to see, we saw a plateau for three to six weeks. Now we're starting to see it tick back up just ever so slightly. What I don't know is if that will be a little blip or if that will be a, a pretty substantive surge. The good news is, is that we have almost 20% of our population that's vaccinated. Then we have another large percentage that have natural immunity because they've already been infected. If There's really no good thing about the surge that happened in December, but it did result in some people who are immune and are still immune from their infections in December and January. So the short answer is, yes, I'm concerned. I, statistically, I don't think it will be as bad um, as it has been just because of the numbers that we know are already immune. You're right, Cliff. Yeah. Are, are you reviewing where, you know, the vaccine's becoming more readily available? I understand that, but it still seems like we have a lot of vaccine in areas where it's not being used because a lot of my constituents are having to drive hours and they are and they, they do it readily to go get a vaccine and you're putting vaccines in communities that if they don't want it i mean davidson county we'll take all you got <laughs> uh you know we'll be more than happy to get a vaccine so are you looking at that to see where you need to send it Yes, sir. Of course, that's been a shift that we've been making over the last week or two. Uh, I will remind you that our allocation methodology heretofore has been a population-based allocation. And how do I say this delicately? <laughs> Local leaders have held us to every single dose of that until a couple of weeks ago. They wanted every single dose in their county. And if I were in that role, I would have done the same thing. Now it's a little bit different because uptake is very different. And as you mentioned, there's some rural counties where literally there are less than 10% of their appointments are filled. A couple of things that I want to reassure you about. One is, and this is a common, a common thing that a lot of people believe may be happening, and maybe even I was concerned until I was educated about it, which is what we're not doing is continuing to send every week to those places. They are not stockpiling it. It is not building up there. We require them to reconcile their inventory every 24 hours, and we have what sort of their weekly set limit is. And if they're not exhausting that, they don't get any the next week. What that does, however, do is, and, and that's just been in the last couple of weeks, what it does is it puts more in the bucket that we have to dole out. And so we can no longer do a population, or let me say, we can no longer only do a population-based allocation because I couldn't send it to, I think, maybe 48 counties this week. There were 48 counties who didn't need any more because they didn't have enough uptake. They already had enough on the shelf. And so what we're starting to do is take that extra allocation and divvy it up amongst the places that do have higher demand. Uh, I will reassure you that Drs. Wright and Jahangir uh, call every day asking for more. And so we're able to do that. Um, uh, we are particularly uh, able to send out more Pfizer. We're, we're now in this weird spot. It's maybe too much detail. I apologize. Uh, we're now in this weird spot where a lot of people want the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but we don't have enough supply of that yet. We have a ton of Pfizer and Pfizer keeps sending more than we expect, but it takes a it takes a special provider to do the Pfizer. They have to have the ultra cold. They have to be able to exhaust a large number of doses, and so the ability to send that out is a little bit limited. Yeah, and I, one quick, and I'm sure you're. I, I would like that list of the 48 counties that that uh, you couldn't send it out to because I'd like to compare how their number of infections go up over the next few weeks. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to try to keep us on schedule here. I'm going to have one more uh, uh, member here give you some questions here. Uh, Representative Smith, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman and Commissioner. Congratulations and Dr. McDonald. Uh, one of the things that we've heard over and over and over throughout COVID and, and lingering is a, a staff shortage with clinical bedside nurses, et cetera. And I'm keeping hearing, I just heard the robust CDC grant is coming. 
we anticipate there's a lot of CARES Act money that is coming. Is there a way that the department could take leadership on this and take some of those CARES Act money and, de and develop some type of a scholarship program that maybe it assists with defraying uh, medical education, if, if maybe a nurse agrees to do five years at the bedside in a hospital or an underserved population, because we do need um, a lot of our educational programs are geared toward independent practice or geared toward, you know, um, uh, office based service. But I think that what we're hearing from our hospitals is a constant shortage and they're paying that $75 an hour, et cetera. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, certainly staffing and staffing allowances and incentives and recruitment and all of the things related to bedside staffing have been magnified during this. We always knew there was a problem before, uh, but this has made it even worse. So to, the short answer to your question is yes, absolutely looking at that money for a lot of different ways. Is that loan repayment? Is it uh, recruiting incentives, uh, su supporting hospitals with signing bonuses? Is it a relook at what they are allowed to do. And they were allowed to do other things during the pandemic and nothing bad happened. And you know what happens after that. So all of those comprehensive approaches, both financially as well as from a policy standpoint, are something that we're trying to learn from and go forward. All right, thank you. Uh, I have one special request. So <laughs> let it not be said that I don't take a special request. Uh, Representative Clements, you're recognized. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm honored, Mr. Chairman. Now, I just wanted to publicly thank the department for helping out. Last weekend, I got to volunteer at the mass vaccination event at the Nissan Stadium, and my shift started at 5 a.m., and there were cars lined up already. And watching that take place and having access to all those vaccines really made a difference because that was a really momentous occasion, and it was something to behold. And I was honored to volunteer at that, and I appreciate the department working with D Davidson County, the health department on that. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your volunteer, uh, your volunteerism there. Uh, there were over 700 volunteers at that, at that event, and uh, it went off appearingly without a hitch. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for your time today and your service to our state and uh, for those, and, and for your team, uh, for the work. And uh, I, I do want to give a special thanks uh, today to Dr. Morgan McDonald, uh, who, uh, for me personally, throughout this pandemic, I, I don't know how many times I've blown up her phone <laughs> on this, but uh, she has given invaluable information and has been a, a complete asset to the state. So thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. All right. Without objection, we will be going back into session. That brings us to our calendar today. Item number one, House Joint Resolution 103. Uh, they're facing you are <laughs> recognized. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. You have a motion second. This is my first time I've ever been the full committee of health. I feel like I need to get a vaccine or something. Yeah. Uh, committee, thank you for... Uh, your indulgence. This is a resolution encouraging Tennesseans to consider donating their, their organs. I've got a personal story and I won't go into it, but I, I, just to let you know, if you wait till you're in the position that you need to make a decision over a loved one whose life is hovering and they come to you and say, Hey, the organs of your loved one are, are, could really save somebody's life. When you're at those times, your, your emotions are, are, are jacked because some of you love dearly. And so if you look at my driver's license, you'll see a little heart on my driver's license. And so they know if I'm in a traumatic wreck and, and I've got traumatic brain injury and there's no hope for me to, to make it, if they've got me on life-saving equipment for the time just to keep me alive, they know that they can take my, my organs. And uh, this is a resolution just encouraging people to look at that. And I don't know if you know this, but Tennessee is one of the number one places in the world for transplants. And Vanderbilt is, is the leader of that. We actually have people who've done transplants um, on this committee and been part of that. And uh, this is just encouraging Tennessee. And it's a resolution that we're going to use the Department of Health and through our social media to get out to, to, um, to consider this, study about it, and uh, make the decision before you get there. All right, thank you. Any questions for the sponsor of the resolution? 
Okay. Seeing none, we're going to vote on House Joint Resolution 103. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. and goes on to count and rules. All right. Without objection, I'm going to go out of order here and call up uh, item number four, House Bill 454. Representative Hodges, you recognize you have a motion and a second. Uh, is your mic on? I don't. What about now? There you go. All okay. right. Um, so this is an immunization bill. Um, and, and what it is, is we have soldiers when they PCS from a different base uh, in a different state to Fort Campbell, uh, their kids are already out of school for a prolonged period of time. And then when they get here, they realize that they still can't enroll their kids in school because they have to have a Tennessee immunization record that their Texas immunization record isn't accepted by the school systems here. Um, and so what this would do is just allow those out-of-state immunization records to be accepted for military families so that they could enroll their kids in school and not have to wait for, for two weeks to get those transferred. Um, and with that, I'll be glad to take any questions. Any questions for the sponsor? Uh, I just get, get clarification. You have an amendment that's traveling with it. Is that correct? Oh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. It's already been adopted, so it's traveling with it, so we don't have to do that. So any questions on the bill as amended? Okay. Seeing none, we are voting on House Bill 454. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Bill goes on to calendar and rolls. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Committee. I appreciate the indulgence of the committee. Uh, with that, we will go to item number two, House Bill 239. Chairman Ramsey, you recognize you have a motion to second. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, um, this, uh, this bill um, that I bring to you today is, is uh, um, it's a bill to frame the importance of a, an issue brought to me from a family that's uh, pretty close to all of us uh, that too many times is obscured by the general publicity of uh, illegal drugs lumped under criminal code. Uh, this, this concerns uh, Corey Gunnels, a 43-year-old man that uh, has a family, two children, a wife, and a father, Doug Gunnels, and many of you may have talked to him. He's our uh, TDOT liaison. And uh, Aranda, I won't go through all of the history of the young man, but in 2011, a, a random uh, a CT scan picked up uh, neuroendocrine carcinoma in him, and uh, which was removed by surgical means. Uh, that uh, carcinoma has a five-year survival rate of 50%. So it's a pretty serious uh, uh, type of cancer. The, uh, uh, he had four years of clear scans after three cycles of chemotherapy and 35 radiations. Um, on and off, uh, after those four years, he's had tumors uh, show back up and, and has had targeted therapy of uh, hormones and chemotherapy of different types, uh, uh, surgical stent uh, done to uh, relieve pressure on his vena cava. Um, and uh, so he brings him here to uh, just about Christmas of last year. He began to have uh, increased growth in number and, and uh, um, the, uh, uh, had further chemotherapy that lasted three or four months. And at, uh, at that point, he got to the point where his, uh, infection susceptibility was so high that, that they, uh, stopped chemotherapy and his tumors have proliferated in his extremities calling, causing, uh, pain. The situation is, is oftentimes we see with a friend of a friend quoted anecdotal evidence of, uh, a Rick Simpson oil, which is a, general category of full extract cannabis oil uh, for topical or oral use. And so he went online, as all of us do, uh, found a Facebook page of 40,000 people that had experience uh, with family members or themselves. Uh, there were anecdotal instances, even in his situation with the particular cancer that he had, that, that had some measures of uh, short-term improvement. 
uh, immediately on taking the oil, which he obtained, unfortunately, by uh, uh, illegally because it's not the possession is not allowed in Tennessee. Uh, his his uh, blood pressure, oxygen, and heart rate improved and stabilized. The uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, pain and cough uh, were uh, significantly diminished. The tumor that caused uh, vocal problems uh, shrank by half, and and so that's the first time in three years he had had any improvement. Um, what we're addressing today is uh, when measures cease to improve or even jeopardize the remaining quality of life. Uh, thank goodness we don't have to make, well, some of us don't have to, but have to make those decisions to tell somebody that we've done all we can. And and I know that all of us, pardon, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, if we do have an amendment. Uh, yeah, we have an amendment that makes the bill the, uh, the 4132. 4132, and that came from the Tennessee Medical Association. And that was for the one that we passed out of subcommittee? It was, sir. Okay, uh, without objection, let's uh, get that on the bill so that we can discuss that. So you have motion second. So all those in favor of amendment 4132 say aye. Opposed? Okay, ayes have it. Okay, we're back on the bill as amended. Um. <clears throat> Uh, can, and, can and essentially that amendment uh, uh, gives the right to possess this particular type of oil in Tennessee, not to make or buy it. Uh, it uh, requires a letter from a patient's primary care physician uh, that attests to the diagnosis of a life-threatening cancer by a rated or recognized licensed cancer center, uh, attests the patient received conventional methods of treatments which have failed, and is signed and dated by the physician yearly. Uh, also in the possession has to be the proof that the oil was purchased uh, lawfully in another state. Um, the, uh, uh, and as I said, the, uh, the intention is this uh, cannabis oil to be taken by ingestion or topically. All right, questions on the uh, amendment or on the, on the bill as amended? Uh, President Leader Gant, you are recognized. That is a proper motion. Uh, we do. We've already we've done one amendment. Withdraw. Move withdraw. Okay. Withdraw your. Motion. Move to withdraw. Okay. All right. We have a, another amendment that's out there. Amendment number 5494. Um, Chairman Kumar, you are recognized. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee. Is there a motion or a second? Okay, there is a motion and a second. I want to thank Chairman Ramsey for bringing us a situation of compassion. And I think it touches all of our hearts from the story that he has described. And I want to support his bill and the amendments that have been put on so far, but certain things and corrections do need to be made. And that is that he describes the situation of of a tragedy in which the cancer in a young person with family, and then it is operated on, and then it has returned, so it is metastatic cancer. The bill does not state so. The bill only says that it is life-threatening cancer. Let's realize that all cancers, when they develop, are life-threatening, certainly, but majority of them can be treated in a satisfactory manner, thanks uh, to advances in medicine today, and those people do not require the RSO or other means of that kind. In this situation, as I said, touching our nerves of compassion, certainly we want to make it possible for this person and others in the same situation to have this remedy available to them. But let us go ahead and make sure that one, it is done in a way that is 
not federally legal, but in Tennessee it is allowed. It is not at this time really scientific, but our heart and our compassion is going to overrule that. The, for that reason, my amendment, what it does is it adds the words that it, the cancer is life-threatening, it is advanced and metastatic, which is the situation that uh, Dr. Ramsey uh, described. It also notes the fact that conventional means of treatment have failed, which is also the situation that Chairman Ramsey has uh, described. It adds to the fact that patient understands that RSL or any form of marijuana extract is not treatment for cancer. We don't want to mislead people, but yet it may alleviate some symptoms towards the later part of life. And I think we respect that. Um, it also says, as the amendments have said previously, that the risks have been explained, and it also wants the patient not to use this remedy in conjunction with opioids. So with that explanation that we are making it so that after this particular patient, for subsequent patients who can have it when they are in the same condition, my amendment only documents that condition, and that condition is that... <clears throat> that uh, the cancer, again, is life-threatening, metastatic, and traditional means have failed, which is a situation that Chairman Ramsey has described. With that, uh, I am uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm going to have uh, Chairman Ramsey, if you can uh, respond, tell us if this is a friendly amendment, unfriendly amendment. The, uh, certainly, the source makes it that it should be friendly, but the actually the original bill had two of these issues in them, um, and the Tennessee Medical Association found it necessary to take those out. So, I I would not want to um, infringe on the suggestions of the Tennessee Medical Association by accepting this amendment and, uh, and in some way, uh, I'm sure that they're not uh, totally and on the book uh, supportive of this, but they have found tolerance for it uh, with their amendment. So I would hate to jeopardize that in any way by, uh, by changing the, uh, the text of the uh, bill. All right, um, Chairman Kumar, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could you kindly tell us which are the two points that they have objection to? The, Chairman the, uh, uh, any, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Chairman, yes. Um, originally, and, and I think maybe the portion in there about uh, defining metastatic cancer is, is something that they did not address. That was not in the original, and that, and that should be adequate to add to the bill, and I wouldn't think would change it su sufficiently or, or significantly. Uh, but the portion about the opioids, they did remove uh, from the original language. And the portion about the physician having to do any uh, recommendation or any counseling, uh, they took all that out. Uh, we had before, we had that the, that the primary care physician would counsel the patient on the uh, consequences of using uh, any unproven uh, materials, and, and they took that out because they didn't want any responsibility on the physician in this situation. So, so that one portion about changing the metastatic, I, that, that's totally fine with me. But the other two, I, I feel like would be, uh, would uh, negate any, any uh, uh, feeling of tolerance from the Tennessee Medical Association. Uh, Chairman Kumar? Uh, well, thank you. The reason I left those in because they were in your original bill. And I was not aware that they had been taken out by TMA. And it's not TMA's bill, it's yours bill, your bill, and it's our <laughs> amendment. And I would like to work with you. I think 
definitely including the metastatic part is very important and you agree with that. Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, Mr. Chairman or uh, Chairman Ramsey, if you will work with me, let us go ahead and repair that and bring it back and make it the right thing. It's a major step we are taking in our state. It's uh, to help people who are in a tragic situation and I think we owe it to them, but let us make it right. And I'd be happy to work with you and uh, we can come back next week with that minor adjustment. Chairman Ramsey. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll certainly bow to the will of the committee. Uh, my intention, and, and I know all of you have looked on the, uh, the information today and see that this bill has been placed in, uh, in general sub in the health committee in uh, uh, the Senate. And what the situation is, is there uh, at least four bills that deal with cannabis this year. And the indication was to me that one of these four bills is intended to be acted on by the Senate. Uh, one of them has already been defeated. Uh, the other one I can't think came up today. One is uh, Chairman Terry's bill. The other is uh, uh, Chairman Wendell's bill and then this bill. And so I was told that uh, that what uh, I was suggested to do, and, uh, and let me ask the uh, uh, legal analyst, I, I think this bill goes to criminal justice next. Uh, if if it's the will of the committee, it would go to criminal yeah. justice. Uh, I think that's the next stop. If if it'd be okay with uh, uh, Dr. Kumar and the committee, uh, I would I would like to pass the bill out. Uh, I will I will um, amend it in criminal justice. Uh, be glad to do that. Uh, it may not pass there, but my instructions were to take it as far as we could and then uh, stop the bill before it goes to calendar and rules. In, in the eventuality that it is a vehicle for the Senate to act, and at that time it will be taken off uh, general sub in the Senate. So I, I'll bow to the will of the committee. Representative Smith, you recognize? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have one question, and this is going to be directed toward legal. In both of the amendments that were brought, both by the bill sponsor and by Dr. Kumar, they reference that this will be a rated or, rec a rated or recognized licensed cancer center. What is the definition of that in code? Is that a uh, oncology practice? Is that a uh, treatment centers of America? What is uh, the definition of a recognized licensed cancer center? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Matt King, legal services, you're recognized. Uh, yes, Chelly Smith, the, the term is not defined. And so it would be left to the plain meaning of the language. Thank you. All right, Chairman uh, Kumar, we are still on your amendment. Okay. All right. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, again, uh, considering the nature of the matter and considering our relationship with Chairman Ramsey, I'm comfortable, uh, and I, my understanding is that he says that if the bill passes this committee on the way to criminal, he will amend it so that it is satisfactory that uh, the word metastatic is added, and I'll be happy to work with him. With that premise, I uh, would uh, ask for the question. Oh, but on that would be on the amendment, but we can't uh, have a statement and then ask for the question. So, uh, okay. Speaker Marsh, you're Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask a question. If we put Chairman Kumar's amendment on here and pass it out, then you could still work together to fix it even with that on there, the way I understand it. Uh, Chairman Ramsey. Uh, yeah, I mean, if it if it's the will of the committee to to add that language into the bill at this moment, that's fine with me. Leader Gant, you recognize? Uh, if it's okay with the sponsor, I, I think the proper motion would be to move to withdraw the amendment, and then we move forward with the original language in the bill. If if the uh, sponsor of the amendment is okay with that, otherwise you can't adjust it uh, going forward and if that if, if I'm thinking correctly here and legal can uh, 
Matt King. Leader Gann, I guess the posture is that we are currently on the amendment um, by Dr. Kumar. That amendment would amend only a portion of the bill. We currently have a bill as amended by uh, 4132 um, that the committee previously took action on. And so um, it would either be that this amendment goes on now or they do another amendment later or would have to override it with an, a new amendment that makes the bill. Leader Gant? Yeah, I think the original sponsor has agreed to do that if we withdraw this amendment. Is that correct? Chairman? Uh, yes, that, that's fine. Uh, that that uh, mechanism would be great with me. I'm fine with that. All right. uh, Chairman Kumar, would you wish to withdraw the amendment? I respect the will of the committee, and thank you. Is that a move to withdraw? Yes. Okay. Uh, amendment 5494 has been withdrawn. We are back on the bill as amended. Uh, Chairman Boyd? Question on the bill as amended. All right. Uh, without objection, we are voting on House Bill 239. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. The bill goes on to criminal justice. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Mr. That brings us to item number three on our calendar. <laughs> Chairman Wendell, you are recognized. You have a proper motion and a second. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members. This bill simply allows a veteran with service-connected quadriplegia to have access to cannabis oil. There is an amendment that, that came up uh, from the subcommittee 4568. Um, can I get a motion? Okay, motion a second on that amendment. Uh, and that rewrites the bill. Can you just briefly explain that to us? That amendment is a result of Dr. Kumar, Representative uh, Smith, and Representative Jernigan. Uh, they asked to have input on the bill, and I accepted their amendment. And it, it narrows the bill to simply apply to a service woman or service man who has been diagnosed with quad quadriplegia as a result of an incident in the service of the United States Armed Forces. And it simply provides for the cannabis oil, not smoking, no other method except cannabis oil. It's a very simple bill. It's a very narrow bill. And it applies to only one example, and that's a quadriplegic, who is a quadriplegic as a result of service in the United States Armed Forces. And the quadriplegia was acquired, not acquired, was inflicted as a result of a service connection. Okay. Any questions on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, we are voting on Amendment 4568. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? Ayes have it. Okay, we are back on the bill as amended, and we have another amendment to consider. On this amendment, 5517. Chairman Kumar, you're recognized. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, I want to thank uh, Chairman Wendell for motion. bringing this amendment. For a uh, it is a justifiable indication in the sense okay, that you have a motion people, second. Okay. Thank you. It is a justifiable indication in the sense that people with uh, quadriplegia or paraplegia have a lot of muscle spasm and a spastic disorder. FDA has approved a synthetic forms of marijuana for four indications. Those are number one, nausea and vomiting of chemotherapy, muscle wasting in AIDS, neuropathic pain, and spastic disorders. So spastic disorders in a paraplegic or a quadriplegic patient are a recognized indication. There is medical science behind it. And it is approved, as I said, by the FDA. So for those reasons, I'm willing to support the bill. My amendment, in addition to quadriplegia, actually adds paraplegia also, because paraplegics also have the same muscle spasm that this would relieve. Um, in addition, I wanted to add that because 
FDA approved remedy for these muscle spasms is available, the physician who gives the letter saying that this that this patient has quadriplegia or periplegia should also add that the legal FDA approved remedy has been tried. I think that should be, if you're going to proceed in a systematic manner, that should be a part of the uh, letter. Um, and that's really my amendment and uh, I move to adopt. Chairman Wendell. Would you like to respond? Dr. Kumar certainly acted good faith throughout the process, and I appreciate his input. I don't disagree with the spirit of his amendment, but simply put, uh, this amounts to a poison pill, not at his intention, but the Tennessee Medical Association wants nothing to do with medical marijuana. And I'm not being critical of the physicians, although they take an oath, and I don't agree with their position because of that oath. However, the Tennessee Medical Association, I can't speak for them, but they want no part of medical marijuana. And this brings them back into the mix. And it's my impression, and we can talk to them and find out what their position is, but uh, we drew them out of this bill because they requested to not be a part of the bill. And this puts them back in it. But I, I'm willing to take the amendment. I'm willing to go forward with it. But I think we're going to have an issue from the Medical Association. And I'm not here to criticize them, but at some point, Tennessee is going to have to deal with this issue in a straightforward way. It's today, maybe, maybe not, but at some point, the voters will demand of this body to do something. Chairman Kumar. Um, thank you, Chairman. Chairman Wendell, I am not a member of the TMA. Right. I am not a member of the TMA, and I'm not in a position here to represent or support TMA. We, we deal with uh, the merits of the issue. And I think your bill has merit. In fact, I have not taken anything away from it. I have added to it. And uh, in that spirit, I think, uh, I don't see why this is a poison pill. I didn't understand that. Well, it's not to me. I, I think you're, you're- Chairman, you're recognized. I'm sorry. I think your rationale is accurate. I don't disagree with you. I don't think your colleagues that are members of the medical community and primary care offices throughout Tennessee for whatever reason, and I can't speak for them, but through their organization, they want no part of medical marijuana. And again, I'm not here to criticize that, Sure. but uh, that's my impression. But I'm willing to take the amendment and let's move forward and I'll take whatever consequences. All I agree to do for a quadriplegic veteran who is disabled as a result of an incident in armed forces, I agreed to carry the bill and, and I'll accept the will of the body. And I know that the members of this committee want to help veterans if they can and we'll just have to do the best we can but I'm willing to take the amendment and move forward with it and I'm not here to, to, to speak to the committee from a position of authority but at some point the general assembly is going to have to deal with medical marijuana it's going to be sooner or later but the public will demand it from each of you to take a stand uh, Representative Smith you recognize and, and again thank you chairman this is directed toward uh, legal uh, because in Healthcare, there are different definitions that sometimes don't match up with what's in the green book. So it, it, could you find us, and you don't have to answer it immediately, but what's the definition of, of uh, paraplegia in the green books as opposed to, and I'll take a, a, a definition from our gentleman in the medical field, what's the paraplegia definition? Because it, in a different capacity in life, I had um, an awareness that hemiplegia which is a partial paralysis was defined differently in code than it is in medical practice. And I want to make sure that we're aware of what we're about to put into law if we're supportive of this bill as defining paraplegia and quadriplegia. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, Matt King, Legal Services, you recognize. Uh, Chair Lay Smith, with respect to the language of the bill, we don't have it defined. Um, so then that would rely upon the plain meaning, which would probably then kick over to a medical uh, definition. Um, I would need to do a bit of research to see if it is elsewhere defined in the code, but for purposes of this bill, it is not. Uh, Chairman Jernigan, you recognize? Well, I'd like to offer my uh, take on what it is. Quadriplegia is C7 and up, and below it, when you break your neck, you're quadriplegic or neurologically uh, from that, and then down below C7 all the way to the T's are Consider paraplegic. 
uh, when you break your back. So it's between your neck and your back. Uh, not only the bones, but neurologically, what they affect from C7 up and then down. So that's what I've understood over the past 30 years, and I think it's probably still accurate. Okay. Chairman Vaughn, you recognize me? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm trying to get comfortable with the term cannabinoid. Uh, where does one find a cannabinoid? Is it have to be prescribed by a doctor? Is it something that is available at the cannabinoid.com? Where, how does one get a cannabinoid? Because from my, where I sit, uh, the, if we're going to make it people who are seeking um, assistance and relief to, a, to a, a problem, if we're putting a hurdle in front of them, I'm not real interested in doing that, but I would like to know what it is. How does one get one? Uh, and I, I may represent, uh, um, recognize the chairman there. Currently, there are medications that are approved uh, by the FDA. Um, Syndros, which is a liquid form of THC, which would be a cannabinoid. Uh, Marinol, which is a pill form. And then there's Epidiolex, which is CBD, essentially. And it's, an, it's a cannabinoid. So I believe that the bill will be referencing those medications. Great. You recognize Acquire some of those. I mean, I know CBD you can buy wherever, but I guess this is the spicy blend that they won't let you have at your local CBD. They're, they're prescribed. And okay. Ch Chairman Kumar, you recognize? On a basic level, there are two main components in marijuana. There are many cannabinoids or cannabis-related compounds in marijuana, but THC is the main one. THC is what causes people high. It is the psychoactive substance. CBD, I call it THC, I call it the high causer. It causes high. CBD is the other component that is more of a relaxation thing. It has very little to, very little THC, less than 1%, although they can cheat. Uh, so CBD is basically a relaxing thing. It's almost like Valium. That's why it is useful in childhood epilepsy. So those are the two components. Now, syn synthetic forms of THC are called cannabinoids. Uh, Dr. Terry mentioned three or four. There are actually six on the market. They are Schedule II and Schedule III substances. Any doctor with a license to practice can write a prescription. If you, if you Google, just say Marinol uh, Walgreens, it tells you it's about a dollar or two a pill. So cannabinoids are synthetic uh, THC or synthetic marijuana that is FDA approved for the conditions that are listed and they are available uh, on prescription from a physician because they are scheduled two and three. Chairman Vaughn. So you're saying that, that then you just carry that prescription to Walgreens or? True. We're not endorsing Walgreens, by the way. No. Okay. So, although they're fine people. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's get some clarification on the amendment here real quick. So part A, a test is we're adding paraplegia to the definition that came out of subcommittee uh, on the, on the, on the bill. Is that correct? Okay. And is that partial, uh, temporary? It just, it does not say one way or the other. True. It does not. Okay. Part B says that the, uh, affirms that the physician has discussed with the patient the potential risks of ben or benefits of use of cannabis, cannabis oil to alleviate the patient's symptoms. That is the uh, what we had amended out of the original bill that I think was objected to uh, by another organization. And uh, if this amendment goes on, uh, this obviously would go towards um, go to criminal justice and the question would be to the sponsor of the bill um, or the sponsor of the amendment working to get that out. Chairman, you recognize? In my amendment, that is taken out because a physician is not allowed legally to counsel people about marijuana. Because then they are 
discussing benefits and so on, and marijuana is illegal. And the license to prescribe those substances is given by the DEA, so that's a federal matter. So yes, it should not be included. Okay. Uh, we are uh, uh, at our time limit here. So uh, without objection, uh, we're going to have some time to look this thing over. So without objection, um, let's... Uh, uh, roll that bill, this bill, in its current posture till next week. All right, without objection. Sure. And with no further business before Thank us, you, we are adjourned.